Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this Friday for our Good Friday service. Uh, I'd like to invite you to please stand and let's sing together. Men of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid silent as he stood accused beaten mocked and scorned took a crown of thorns on a rugged cross my salvation where you love poured out over me and now my soul cries out and under unto Thee. Sent of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase sins, redeem, and reconcile the faith. salvation will you love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee now my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full. By the precious blood that my Jesus spilled, now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Through the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation.
like to turn our attention to the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. Today, we remember Jesus going to the cross to pay the price that we owed. We talk about this all the time, about how Jesus went and he died for us, that our sins can be forgiven. It's only through his sacrifice that we can even approach the thorn of grace. So let's continue to reflect on how Jesus prayed, paid. So let's continue to reflect on the fact that Jesus paid the price for us and for our sins, that through him we can have eternal life. Savior say thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all and all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe my sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow lord now indeed i find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spot The heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Before the throne, I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall still repeat. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. My sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow, and he washed it white as snow. the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead no praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead oh praise the one who This life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain. 
He washed it white as snow. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the price that you paid, that we can be seen white as snow. Lord, thank you that you went to the cross, that we can be seen blameless, Lord. You paid the price for our sin, and Lord, we are so grateful. Thank you for your love poured out for us. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading this afternoon is found in the book of Isaiah. If you grab your Bibles at home, uh, we can turn there and reflect on this passage together. It's Isaiah chapter 52, and we're going to be starting in verse 13. It's Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, in his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. In that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Please pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for this passage that was prophesied thousands of years ago Yet it is our Savior that it is speaking about. It is the Savior of the world. And like a sheep that was led away to slaughter, your Son willingly did that for our sake, God. Did not deserve any of it, yet took the weight of our punishment. And he has counted to us righteousness, his own righteousness, God. As we reflect on this passage together, as we listen to Tom preach this word, God, that you would draw our hearts towards you, help us to understand it, give us humility and insight into your gospel and let it change our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon. 
Today, as we celebrate Good Friday, the day on which Christ died on the cross, I'm finding it uh, particularly difficult to speak to you in this way because a Good Friday service, in my experience, requires a, a close setting, a family-type setting, and often we reset the auditorium so that the chairs are in a circle around the table for our time of reflection and contemplation. But uh, today, I'd rather that you think of this more as a Bible study than as a worship service. And each of us, uh, as we're sitting at home in front of our television with our family or alone in front of our computer, should get our Bible out and turn to the passage that was just read, Isaiah chapter 53. And what I'd like to do is walk you through this passage in a way that will help you to reflect on it and understand it and apply it. At the very end of the Gospel of Luke, in the last chapter, an event is recorded that happened on the day of the resurrection, on that Sunday afternoon. We're told that two disciples of Jesus were walking uh, on a road from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus, about a seven-mile walk. And uh, as they were walking along, a person joined them and asked them what they were talking about. And they told him of their immense sorrow that this man named Jesus, whom they thought was the Jewish Messiah, had been put to death on a cross and buried in a hillside tomb. But some women who were their fellow compatriots of Jesus had told them that that morning they'd gone to the tomb and found it to be empty. And some others of their number had gone and saw that it was so, but they didn't find Jesus. And these two disciples uh, just didn't know what to believe. Now, the person walking with them was Jesus, though Luke tells us that they were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer and enter into his glory? And Luke adds then, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Don't you wish you could have been there that Sunday afternoon and heard Jesus himself open up the scriptures in such a way as to give insight into how all of those passages pointed to him. I mean, what I, what I heard so many years ago from Dr. Howard Hendricks is undoubtedly true. Cut the Bible anywhere and it will bleed the blood of Christ. Well, in fact, we do have a lot of insight into what Jesus said to them that day. Um, we gain that insight by simply reading the New Testament because the New Testament tells us how the apostles and others understood the Old Testament scriptures. We gain insight into the message that they used in speaking to their fellow uh, Jewish relatives and friends about Jesus. That they used the Old Testament and they brought out dozens of texts along with specific interpretations of those texts that demonstrated that those passages pointed towards Jesus as the Messiah. And we know that their efforts were richly rewarded in the New Testament times as well as beyond as uh, many, many Jewish people who came out of the Old Covenant came to believe in Jesus and joined the Christian movement. Now, of all those passages that are cited from the Old Testament, perhaps the most important one is Isaiah chapter 53. It's uh, cited in the Gospels and even more in the letters and the rest of the New Testament as uh, a passage that points directly to the Messiah, the Christ, along with uh, an understanding of what his suffering and death meant. In fact, more than any passage in the Old Testament, it provides the basis on which Jesus could say to those two disciples on the Emmaus Road, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer and to enter into his glory? You see, Isaiah 53 is the summit of all prophecy. It is the heart of the Old Testament's prediction of the Messiah and his accomplishment. 
And if a church of God's people were to meet every Good Friday for a hundred years and only use Isaiah 53 as the source of their teaching and contemplation and worship, at the end of a hundred years, they would still have only scratched the surface of the magnitude of the nurturing richness of uh, this incredible passage. So today I'd like to use it one more time to allow God to speak to our hearts about what is at the heart of our faith. Due to the immense length and the comprehensiveness of the prophecy of Isaiah, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, there are really few scholars who have spent uh, much of their lives studying this book, like there are scholars of other parts of the Old Testament. And those who have studied it very deeply have brought to the surface for the rest of us a number of very important things about this book. One is that the book divides into two parts. The first roughly half, chapters 1 through 39, are often called the book of judgment. And they contain predictions or prophecies that Isaiah the prophet made from the standpoint of his own experience in his own generation. He uh, spoke words of judgment on Israel because of their sins. He gave promises of future redemption. He spoke words of judgment on the surrounding nations because of their mistreatment of Israel, uh, along with some future prophecies of things that were to come. And he spoke often of uh, political situations that were uh, around during his lifetime. That's the first half. But chapters 40 through 66 are very different. They're, different. They're called the Book of Comfort. In uh, that part of the book, it's written from a different standpoint. It's written from the perspective of a future time when Israel has been taken into exile. That wasn't going to happen for 150 years, but after predicting in a lot of detail their being taken into exile, then he makes all kinds of predictions from that viewpoint as to the future, when they would be restored to the land, and even far beyond that, to the new heavens and the new earth. In fact, the content of these two parts of Isaiah, the book of judgment and the book of comfort, are so different that many scholars from the past have said that there must have been two different Isaiahs, two different authors, writing at two different times. But a lot of research has shown that, uh, in fact, the book seems to be by one single author because the vocabulary is the same throughout. There are a number of phrases that are repeated throughout. The grammar and use of Hebrew is the same throughout the book as though a single author wrote it. Now, in the second half of the book, in which Isaiah 53 occurs, there are four servant songs. These are um, four songs that identify a person called the servant of the Lord. And the identity of the servant of the Lord is perhaps the clearest point of difference between Jewish interpreters and Christian interpreters down through the centuries. Generally, Jewish interpreters understand the servant of the Lord in each of the servant songs to be referring to Israel, the whole nation. Um, Christian interpreters, on the other hand, have generally said from the very first days that it refers to the Messiah. However, many evangelicals interpre evangelical interpreters of the last hundred years have noted that the identity of the servant of the Lord changes or grows, morphs, you might say, as you go through the four servant songs. At the beginning, it could possibly speak of, of uh, the nation of Israel, but then it clearly speaks from the perspective or as the voice of the faithful remnant within Israel. That is, the true believers within Israel and the words faithful remnant are an important theme throughout Isaiah and the prophets of his time. And then it morphs from being the voice of the faithful remnant to the identity of the servant being an individual who is the representative of the faithful remnant, and that is the Messiah. And that viewpoint in the last hundred years has spawned dozens of books about the identity of the servant of the Lord, but it is almost certainly right. Isaiah 53 is the last of the four, the four servant songs, and it is certainly about an individual. He's separate from the nation. In fact, in the song, when you read the words we or us, it is the faithful remnant as the disciples of the Messiah speaking to him. But when it refers to he, 
It is always this individual whom they look to and whom they are singing about. This song is something you really need to open your Bible and look at, Isaiah chapter 53. Actually, the passage starts in the chapter before. The whole passage is Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, verse 12, as Devin read it to you. The section has a heading in my Bible. I'm using the English Standard Version. It says he was pierced for our transgressions. And there's not another heading until you get to chapter 54. So this is one unit of material. And it begins with the same words that begin the first servant song in Isaiah 42. Behold my servant. Now this song has five stanzas. I'd like you to see that. Each stanza is three verses long. The first stanza is chapter 52, verses 13 through 15. And then, secondly, you have chapter 53, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. The fourth one is 7 through 9. And the last of the stanzas is verses 10 through 12. Now, it happens that these five stanzas taken together form what is called a chiasm. I don't want to take a lot of time explaining this, but it's a literary device that is used very commonly in the Bible. You have to remember the, uh, that the Bible was written long before they had the kinds of punctuation that we use. There were no subject headings. Things were not divided into chapters, even into sentences. There were no periods, commas, anything like that. The Bible was written before modern punctuation. And the idea of a chiasm is based on the Greek letter chi, which is shaped like an X in our alphabet. It describes something in which the first and last element of a chiasm relate to each other. They're about the same subject. And then, in this case, the second and the fourth also mirror each other. And then there's a middle element, a third one. So what I'd like to do is, um, look at this and kind of explain how Isaiah unfolds, Isaiah 53 unfolds, with Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 6 being the key middle element of the song. The first stanza, if you look at it, verses 13 through 15 of chapter 52, says that the servant will be exalted and he will be humiliated. And that is kind of an enigma when you read it because it doesn't explain how this person can be both exalted and humiliated. And then the last stanza, the last three verses of chapter 53, also say that the servant will be exalted and humiliated, but it says he will be exalted because he was first humiliated for a specific reason that has been brought out in the intervening verses. And then when you move to the second stanza, it says that the, the Messiah, the servant of the Lord, was rejected in life. He was despised and rejected by men. We esteemed him not. This is the faithful remnant speaking and saying when he came on the scene, we had no comprehension of who he was. He was just a normal person. In fact, he seemed to have been characterized by sorrow and uh, by affliction not by anything special. He was not special looking. He didn't stand out in any way. He was rejected in life. And then the fourth stanza mirrors that. It says he was rejected in, in death as well. That's the passage that says he was falsely accused. He died unjustly as though he were a criminal. The intent was to throw him in a common grave with other criminals, but he made his tomb with a rich man in his burial. And these verses describe his humiliation. So they both say, mirroring each other, he was rejected in life and he was rejected in death. And then you come to the middle stanza, verses four through six, and this is the key to the servant song. It, it uh, explains the nature of his humiliation. It's like an interpretation of what was going on when Jesus died on the cross. Let me read it to you. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, the servant song is written from the perspective of the faithful remnant. These are those who are looking back on their experience of the Messiah. Now as believers, now as his disciples, they're looking back. And they're saying, verses 1 through 3, when he came, we didn't honor him because he seemed to be someone of no importance. He was from an obscure village. His parents weren't important. He wasn't trained in any kind of theological school. He wasn't particularly attractive. He was one who experienced sorrow. And then verse 7 through 9, though we thought he died unjustly, we figured he was just uh, being afflicted by God. This could be the words of the disciples on the Emmaus Road, verses 7 through 9, where they said, we had hoped that he was to be the one to redeem Israel. But it's the middle stanza that's the key, verses 4 through 7. This gives the real meaning behind his death, which the faithful remnant only later come to understand. What they thought was simply punishment, possibly unjust punishment, was in fact substitution in their place for their sins. And do you see it? Verse 4. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, meaning we thought he was simply a man suffering punishment, whether justly or unjustly. Then verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. You see, without the key, the, the meaning of the death of Christ is kind of a mystery, according to this song, as it is for most people today. It's an enigma. But with that understanding that's given, it's like a theological interpretation of his death. We understand why he was dying on the cross. Uh, His death was substitutionary. It was God's doing. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You have to remember people who stood at the cross had no idea what was going on in the heavenly realms at that moment. They had no insight into what was happening. They may have thought... It was unjust. Undoubtedly, his mother and others gathered there thought that. But many who were standing around would have figured, you don't get condemned to death if you're not guilty of something, at least. And there was nothing about the scene that gave away the real truth of what was going on at that moment. That came only later, even for the disciples. That understanding that is only brought by God tearing away the veil from the human mind That understanding that what was going on was made real by the resurrection in which he was raised from the dead. The proof positive that what happened when he died was real and sufficient. And that is, after the resurrection, the understanding that when Jesus died, he died as a substitute for sinners. You know, people have come up through the century with centuries with so many different understandings of what happened when Jesus died. Can I just describe a few of them for you? One you might call the view Christ the Conqueror. This perspective is that the chief reason for the death of Jesus was to um, violate, overcome, subjugate all the spiritual powers of the universe. And there are verses in the New Testament that say that. This was taught in the early church. Uh, Christ The New Testament says, was victorious over all the spirits of the universe, all the evil powers by his death. But the problem is when you make that idea that Christ was victorious, the meaning of his death, the central purpose of his death, you're confusing one of the results of his death with the the meaning of his death. That view has been historically called Christus Victor, Christ the Conqueror. Um, There's another view that Christ died to uphold the moral government of God and to show how important it is. It's it's kind of like a conquering army when they come in, gathering together the soldiers of the defeated side, counting them off by tens, and executing every tenth person. They don't do it because that tenth person is somehow more culpable than someone else, more guilty of sin. They do it as an example to everyone in that country that they've now defeated of the foolishness of their rebellion against them. They're showing to everyone the the consequences of guilt for rebelling. 
And this view is that when Christ died, he didn't die for individuals. He died to uphold the moral government of God, to show by giving us an example of punishment so that we'll be, we'll be motivated to do better in the future. Now, there's truth to this view as well in some ways, but um, it doesn't deal with sin. It's dealing with um, not the disease of sin that has infected the human being. It's simply demonstrating that we ought to do better in the future. That has historically been called the governmental theory of the atonement. That's actually uh, quite common in many churches. And then there's another one besides those two that Christ is an example. The example theory of the atonement is that Christ was the supreme example of love. He showed the importance of love for God and how great God is and God's truth is to motivate us to follow his example of other-centered love. And in fact, Peter says that Christ is a supreme example by his death and by his life. But if you use that as the central purpose of the atonement, then you make uh, the meaning of his death just a set of moral teachings that you ought to obey and you haven't done that in the past. You need to repent of not doing that. That's Christ as the example. But let me say that as there might be elements of truth in all of those things, they don't get to the heart of why Jesus died. The Bible is very clear and very precise on the central purpose for the death of Jesus on the cross. Jesus died a criminal's death. Though he was innocent, in the place of other people, to satisfy the justice of God against their sin. Let me say that again. Jesus Christ died a criminal's death, though he was innocent, in the place of other people to satisfy the justice of God for their sin. The full name of that understanding of the atonement, which has been held from the earliest days of the Christian church is something like judicial satisfaction by substitution. You satisfy divine justice and our breaking of God's moral law by taking the punishment of death in our place. Now that's the clear meaning of these verses. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, that means punishment, that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have turned away, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus Christ died a criminal's death, though he was innocent, to pay in the place of other people the satisfaction of the justice of God against their sin. Now, in the modern world, that's an idea that people don't like. And that's why this understanding of the atonement, which is so clearly stated in Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, both in the law and the gospel, that's why it's so hated. The idea that God substituted his sinless son in the place of guilty sinners seems to be unjust. It smacks to the contemporary mind of a bloodthirsty, vindictive kind of God taking out in his son the punishment that other people deserved. And because God, many people find that thought repulsive, they've come up with so many ways to get around it, far more than I've explained so briefly here. But Scripture does really not allow us any wiggle room to get around it. As Jesus said of himself, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for, anti in Greek, meaning in place of many. He said that he died in place of other people and of their death. Our place is not to try to get around what Scripture says. Our place is simply to understand and defend and uphold what Scripture clearly teaches as the meaning of the death of Christ. So let me note for you three things that we have because of this truth. The clear teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ died a criminal's death, though he was innocent, in the place of other people, 
in order to satisfy the justice of God against their sin is the source of three great convic convictions that ought to fortify us in our personal experience of knowing God and seeking to live for him. It ought to shape the very nature of our Christian lives. And the first is this. The truth most clearly stated by the Apostle Paul that we cling to, that we confess as Christians, is Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3, the most succinct summary of the gospel message is found there in its fullness. But the first part of it is, Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That's the confession of the believing community. That's what we confess in the Apostles' Creed and in other ways when we sing. Christ died for our sins. And those words, Christ died for our sins, are deeply informed by the entire Old Testament and most meaningful by uh, verses 4 through 6 of Isaiah 53. What does that mean? Christ died for our sins. And what it means to us is that when we confess those words, Christ died for our sins, we're meant to reason out from that confession, he died for my sins individually and personally. And what that tells us is this. Christ didn't die simply for sin, as though it were sort of a theological category. He didn't even die for sin in the sense of various kinds of sins that you might think of in life. It says he died for sins, meaning the individual acts of individual sinners. What that means is that we as Christians have confidence that Christ died for our individual acts of rebellion against God. Jesus didn't simply die for the sins of lying and cheating and anger and immorality or swearing. He died for all the unique ways in which you and I have committed those sins, the ways in which we have experienced those sins manifested in our own lives, in our own unique experience. It's your acts and my acts of lying, immorality, anger, and so forth. We have the assurance that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die in some broad category for sin. He died for our sins uniquely and individually and that they were taken away as far as the east is from the west. Whatever your individual sins are in whatever way they cling to you or shape your feelings about yourself, in whatever way you experienced or still experience the consequences of your sin, Christ died for those things. That's the first thing. Our confidence is that Christ took the punishment for all our individual sins. He has given us his peace in their place. Upon him was the punishment that brought us peace. Now, the second thing is this. We have the assurance that Jesus dealt not just with, every, uh, with our sins in a spiritual sense, but he dealt with every aspect of our need as human beings. And this is very clearly brought out in the passage. I want you to look first at verse 5. Behold, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities and so forth. Um, this tells us that when Jesus died, he died for our individual acts of rebellion against God, our sins, our iniquities. And that's certainly true. He died for our sins in an objective sense. They can be listed and we can understand what they are. We can, if we are able, call them to call them to mind and to know that they have been dealt with at the cross. But this passage also says he died for us in a subjective sense of our experience. Let me explain what I mean. Verse 4, look at it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Or the end of verse 5, and with his wounds we are healed. This is dealing with our subjective condition. And what I mean is our sins are our objective acts that we have performed, but we also experience as we move through this life, we experience sin not only as our own acts for which we're culpable, we experience sin as a power that is opposed to us, that infects us and uh, affects us in ways far beyond our own actions. We live in a fallen world. We experience many things, not only because of our sin, 
But because we live in a sinful world, and this includes physical problems like disease and handicaps and personal physical limitations. It includes mental problems described here as griefs and sorrows. Things like depression and anxiety and other mood disorders. These things are not as God created the world. We experience them as the external results of sin coming against us. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died not only to restore us to God, to forgive our acts of sin. He died, this passage says, for our condition individually, for our experience of the effects of sin individually. Some have misused this. You may have heard them on television. Faith healers who say there's healing in the atonement. After all, by his wounds we are healed. And they say that any person who claims physical healing in the name of Jesus will be healed if they don't. It's simply a matter of their faith. But that's not true. That's not true in our experience as we go through this world. And it's certainly not true in Scripture. I mean, the fact is, just as our final forgiveness for our individual sins, really, the full experience that awaits a future time when we're in the presence of God in heaven. In the same way, the completion of what Christ did for all of the ways in which we've been sinned against and impacted by sin awaits a future time. And the fact is, there is healing in the atonement. And that healing is in heaven. It's not necessarily now, but we have the assurance, we have the conviction as believers that we will be ultimately whole, complete, physically, spiritually, relationally, emotionally, psychologically, we'll be complete because Jesus died for our sins. Those are the first two things, and the last one is this. Last week, we have the assurance that God the Father is the one who did this for our salvation. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The death of Christ was not a mistake. It was not merely an example. The death of Christ was the fulfillment of the everlasting covenant of redemption, the plan of salvation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit was planned by the Father, carried out by the Son, and applied by the Spirit for our salvation. Oh, that's the meaning of the death of Christ. That's the central heart of what the Christian faith is all about. And on Good Friday, we do well as we do to some extent every Lord's Day when we gather together and especially when we celebrate communion, but especially we might say when we commemorate that very point when Jesus died, we do well to reflect on this truth that is so clearly brought out in this, the heart of the Old Testament prophets. May God bless the reading and the contemplation of his word to your strengthening and encouragement today. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sin plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as 
as He wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as He wash all my sins away. Dear dying Lamb, Thy precious blood shall never lose its power. some church of God be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no more to all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more ever since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die in this poor list springs dampering tongue lies silent in the grave then in a nobler sweeter song I'll sing thy part to say I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Well, note the words of that great song that our brother just sang to us. The closing words, when this poor, lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. What a great song. And I hope that it reflects your own heart and your own desire as you go through this word, world that when you come to the end, that that will be the epitaph that people think of on your tomb. Sunday morning, we are going to post the service live at 9.30 in the morning. And uh, we'd be able to be watched at any time after that. We invite you to be a part of that as we celebrate the resurrection of the Son of God. Go in grace and serve the Lord.